This is an exhibition that um, features 30 artists from 11 different countries. So I just wanted to stop in here briefly. So um, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit that looks at plastic as um, a material that artists are working with, as well as artists using um, plastic to comment on uh, throwaway culture, um, consumerism, um, pollution, contamination in, in the oceans, um, but also kind of the future, you know, what the future looks like through um, the use of plastic too. So uh, this exhibition has a lot of cross-cultural connections <laughs> in it. So. Um, but I really want to speak um, a little bit about the Diego Rivera and Rufino Tamayo paintings. Um, but I wanted to bring you in here so you could have a, I don't know, a teaser for those of you who haven't seen the show to want to come back. Um, it's divided into three sections, the archive at the far end, um, the entangled present, so how our individual lives are entangled with this material and how the earth will be entangled with it forever. And then um, speculative futures. So um, these are artists who are uh, working with 3D printing, um, crocheting with plastic, thinking about what types of creatures can actually digest plastic in the future. You know, some very fantastical um, imaginings in this section as well as plastiglomerates so how our geological bedrock now has um, objects that stones we're calling them because they have non-organic material in them but that's this case in this middle here um, of what's being found now on the beaches um, in Hawaii, so you have the fusion of sand and um, rock, but also plastics too. So this is, I, I was speaking with an, an archeologist today who came through and um, he works specifically in um, the Hawaiian Islands. And I said, do you see a lot of plastic? Are you like digging through layers of plastic um, now? And he said, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's everywhere, yeah. So um, anyway, we'll head on over into, uh, I'm so glad it's a small group so we can enjoy a intimate um, viewing experience in our graves gallery. These artists connect through. The oh, culture. yeah. This is um, was organized by Penn State University, and we're the only West Coast um, academic institution taking it. Um, so the curators at Penn State at the Palmer Museum of Art. Um, it was a group of three women: an art historian, a um, environmental science uh, professor, and a scientist. Worked together through all their connections and just what they were, um, you know, different references they were getting. And um, they put together that group of artists. Some of them have enormous careers. Yeah. Um, and some of them, uh, you know, teach at Penn State, you know. So it's a great mix of, of people. Are you okay? Do you want me to open the other door? That's the entire show. Yeah, yeah, that's the entire show. Um, it feels really nice in that space. It worked out well. Um, now, have I spoken with any of you about this show yes, before? I know we talked. Yeah, um, maybe downstairs. Yeah, I, I just. Yeah. I'm so passionate about this work, and I'm so happy that you're here and, and we can talk about it. Um, this is a show called Floricanto, 
And the shows I organize here as the um, associate curator of Latin American art, I try to give them a Spanish title. Um, and Flori Canto actually comes from um, a Nahuatl um, phrase, which um, two words um, can mean one thing um, or several things, but um, flower and song, when you um, say them together, flori canto, it means poetry. It can also mean um, symbolism um, as well. So I brought, I was thinking of these two works that we have on loan from Art Bridges, um, a new foundation, and their sole purpose is to not have any art in storage. <laughs> so everything that their founder, Alice Walton, purchases, they try to get it out into the world um, to organize, you know, institutions, art museums in the United States um, who wouldn't have access, you know, to these great masterpieces. Um, so we were very lucky that they contacted um, George Schnitzer Museum of Art and offered first um, Diego Rivera's La Ofrenda from 1931. And then they said, hey, we just, uh, you know, we're able to purchase another work, Rufino Tamayo's Pero Ayuyando a la Luna. Do you have room for that, too? So. Um, that's kind of where the floor, e canto, comes in, the flower and, and song um, idea. And I think that um, these works, I'm not sure that they've ever been exhibited together. The last time this painting was on the West Coast was in 1944, and it was shown at the Henry Art Gallery, actually. And then it went. It traveled in the 50s a bit, and then it went into private hands. And this is the first time it's you know, been acquired by an institution that's lending it publicly. So we're really thrilled to, um, to have La Ofrenda. Um, just thinking about these uh, cross-cultural connections, these two works are great examples of two artists at the height of their career working in the United States. So two artists from Mexico coming to the US um, in the 20s and 30s and uh, just having amazing experiences um, exhibiting their work in galleries and also in institutions. This painting was shown for the first time in the same year it was painted, 1931, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. How does Rivera, you know, someone who's painting murals in Mexico City, get a show um, in New York City? Well, he had to go to Moscow. <laughs> and this just shows you kind of how things have really um, change, you know, these changing dynamics that happen. He goes to Moscow um, with a group of uh, communists, uh, uh, individuals from Mexico City to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the revolution there. And of course, Mexico had recently had its own revolution from 1910 to 1920. In 27, he goes to Moscow and he spends eight months there. And he meets two gentlemen who are getting ready to open the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And this is Alfred Barr, who becomes the first director, um, and the deputy director, Jerry. I'm forgetting his last name, but it's G-E-R-E. Um, so these two men are there. What are they doing in Moscow? Well, this was kind of the place to go to find out what is happening in the cutting edge of contemporary art or modern art at that time. Um, Alfred Barr actually buys a work by Rivera, and they start talking about a show once MoMA opens. So Rivera comes to the US in 1931, and he's taking a steamership for part of that trip. Um, 
and he's painting on the ship, you know, while he's coming um, up to New York City, and he comes several weeks early because he's going to actually paint some portable murals to go on view with these canvases and some drawings. Um, it was a huge success. Uh, one of MoMA's founders, Abby Eldridge Rockefeller, um, helped fund the show, and she purchased this work. Um, and for a while, it was actually in MoMA's collection before it started traveling. And then um, I think it you know, came out of the collection and then um, took on a new life. But what he's painting here is a very traditional um, Mexican, uh, well, holiday in a way, festival. Um, uh, Dia de los Muertos, the Day of Remembrance, um, and uh, celebrating life as well as death. Um, it's All Saints Day and All Souls Day, November 1st and 2nd. So these two um, young women have set up their altar. And the cult of the dead goes back thousands of years in Mexico. And of course, with the Spanish Catholic influence, you know, it starts um, continuing, but in a different way, um, but they still um, go to the cemetery here. It's a very tropical image um, landscape. But um, they, they will go to the cemetery and await the souls of loved ones who have passed on because they believe that they come and visit. So how does the soul know where to find their family? Well, they follow these marigold flowers. So you're going to see the Sempansuchilto flowers there, the smell and the color to lead you. They're going to smell their favorite food, which is on the altar. And they're really thirsty, so they're going to drink some water, which has been left out there. And then you want them to stay a while. So sometimes there's music, sometimes there's their favorite objects. Um, so it's a wonderful um, time of um, uh, remembering those who have passed on. And that's what he's presenting here. So something very, um, you know, tied to tradition in Mexico. Um, and this figure is perhaps coming um, in with another, um, another offering to add to the group. I have a, a theory that maybe he started painting this in November. His show opened in December. Um, and Sergei Eisenstein, a very famous Russian filmmaker, was in Mexico at the time. And he was filming Que Viva Mexico movie. Um, and they were there for Day of the Dead. So Rivera was with him, and they were looking at all the film you know, every night and editing. Um, it together and having conversations. So I think maybe perhaps, you know, that experience um, was the inspiration for, for this work. Um, Tamayo, say a few things about him. He came to New York earlier than Rivera. Tamayo came in 1926 with a very famous uh, composer, uh, Carlos Chavez. And the two of them came, and Tamayo said, I was made in America. It's really interesting. He felt that it was so um, you know, influential in his formation as an artist. Um, well, there's a couple of things going on here. When this painting was made, it's 1942. So he spent um, a few decades kind of going back and forth. Uh, New York, Mexico, he was teaching in New York, showing it galleries, um, and his work was being collected by institutions like Chicago Art Institute, MoMA, Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. He was having great success, but of course, um, uh, the two things coming together in this piece, one is he's seen Picasso's Guernica. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine Picasso's Guernica, which was a protest against um, civil war and um, the atrocities committed to um, living beings, um, you'll remember this horse and you know the 
um, these cries um, of pain and all. And he sees Guernica in New York City. Now, of course, it's back into Spain. But for a while, it was in New York for quite some time. And he's also, though, he spent quite a bit of time um, looking and studying pre-Columbian art um, in Mexico before he came to the state. So there are these hairless Mexican dogs um, that go back thousands of years, actually, their breed. And um, they're, they're believed to guide um, the dead through the underworld to accompany them. Um, but they're, you know, actual pets as well. Um, and they would be fashioned out of ceramic and placed in uh, graves, in tombs. Um, and these dogs, um, again, you know, something that is made to accompany the person as they go on their journey um, through the underworld, because that's um, the journey continues. <laughs> what we're living is just a dream right now, but it, it starts when we, when we die, you know, that, that journey of going to different levels and, and your companions. So in 1942, he's very stressed in the United States that he's going to be drafted. And you can feel um, this sense of anguish and solitude, um, scarcity, um, of this, you know, howling dog. It's uh, somewhat different than Rivera in that um, he's referencing um, the, his uh, past and Mexico, but at the same time to a New York audience, they're reading, you know, references to European modernism or to Picasso also in the work and, um, you know, his bright colors and all. Um, are, are very striking, but he's very interested in color, form, line, um, and not wanting to, say, tie himself down to more socio-political imagery um, at the time. So he eventually um, moves to Paris and then back to Mexico. And he acquired an incredible collection, both of pre-Columbian work and um, European art because of all of his connections in the US as well as um, in France. And that was all donated to um, the people of Mexico. So go to Mexico City. You can go to the Rufino Tamayo Museum. And rather than seeing a lot of his work there, you're going to see the work of people like um, Picasso, Leger, um, Adolf Gottlieb, you know, a lot of these artists who were um, active in the um, 30s, 40s, 50s, who he collected. And then his pre-Columbian collection went to Oaxaca, Mexico. So there's another museum there of over a thousand um, objects from ancient times. So two works made in the United States by artists from Latin America, um, from Mexico, um, who are both drawing from their past, but really also um, in touch with um, what's happening in the States and the arts at that time, too. OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the dog and, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. But I think other Latin countries, uh, we were in Ecuador, and we went to the cemetery of the day, and it was all being happening. So I just, I didn't, a lot of people don't. Yeah, I know you're you know absolutely that. right. Yeah. I, um, there are several countries in uh, Latin America, or South America, Central America, who celebrate Day of the Dead, as well as, of course, here in, in the U.S. with a lot of um, Latinx communities, yeah. And here at the museum, mm -hmm. I invite you all next back week. for that. Yeah, next week. <laughs> so um, I thought the great 
Yeah, I'm going to focus on two Korean artists with international ties. So the first one is Kim Ee Kyung. So Kim Ee Kyung is a ceramicist. She's, I believe, 83 years old this year, and we are standing around her stools. In fact, you may sit on her stools if you would like. Um, Kim Ee Kyung was training as a ceramic engineer right after the Korean War. And she had American professors. And she um, confided in one of them that although she was interested in ceramic engineering as a scientist, in fact, she had really fallen in love with ceramics as an artistic medium as well. And he said, well, if that is the case, I will make telephone calls and put you in touch with the program at Alfred in upstate New York, which is kind of the preeminent US um, program in ceramics. And she ended up coming to Alfred, at which point she happened to be there at a time when a very important British ceramicist, Bernard Leach, came to lecture. And she was sitting in class listening to him, and he was showing slides and saying the most beautiful functional ceramics that were ever made were made in the Choson dynasty in Korea. They are white porcelains. And she thought, I'm Korean. I don't know anything about these things. But of course, she had grown up at a time of great privation and had to live through the Korean War. And there were other things on people's minds than cultural patrimony. And so inspired by Bernard Leach, um, she had gotten a grant through the Korean government. And part of her duty was to go back and teach. But she admits herself she's um, rather outspoken. And as a woman going back to teach in a Korean university, she quickly came to loggerheads with the male department head who didn't want to hear any of her guff and wanted her just to behave in a nice way. And she refused. And so she ended up not having that job anymore. And so she finished her service to the Korean government by working as an art handler in the National Museum of Korea, where she had the opportunity to handle Choson Dynasty white porcelains all day, every day, for many years. That became the formative influence in her own work. And um, because we're in a show that is focusing mostly on contemporary art, I don't have a Choson ceramic to show you. But I do have another work by one of Kimmy Kyung's colleagues, uh, Lee Yong Ho, uh, that is reminiscent of Korean porcelains of that um, stage. So they are beautiful, they are white, but they are unpretentious. As beautiful as this is, it's not, and I hate to set up these kind of cultural scapegoats, but it is not the perhaps soulless perfection of Chinese ceramics, and it is not the slightly um, eccentric, perhaps even in some cases perverted um, um, irregularity that one associates with some Japanese tea ceramics. It's something kind of its own self and a little bit in the middle. And um, one falls back on stereotype to talk about them, that people talk endlessly about sort of the naturalness of Korean ceramics. And I don't really honestly understand what that means. But I do think unpretentious is the key. Um, so Kim Ee-kyung got to handle those ceramics. She started to create white ceramics that were tipping the hat to the past, but not pretending to be, not facsimiles of Choson pieces. Then she started playing. And these pieces are obviously not white porcelain, but these are experimental pieces that she made by grinding up fired porcelain and creating something called grog that she then mixed with other clay and mold cast into these shapes that she then textured and glazed and fired. And so these are intended to be garden stools. And they are my favorite place to meet in the museum because as you now know, they're incredibly intimate, they're comfortable, but like Choson ceramics, they are unpretentious. You can sit here very naturally and have a meeting, and it's not kind of the stuffiness of sitting at a desk or at you know, a very official looking meeting space, but something much more relaxed and casual and comfortable. And I think it would be the, the height of luxury to have such things in one's garden. But um, we borrowed a few of these stools from a local collector um, for our legacy show, uh, the museum's 80th anniversary. But understandably, the collector was not enthusiastic about having people sit on them. Mm -hmm. So 
Jill and I, our director and I, went back to Korea and happened upon a show of these. And we, it was fun. We were like in fairyland. It was like jumping from toadstool to toadstool, sitting on all of them and deciding which ones we liked best. And um, we can't do it here, but at the gallery, we were able to actually sit and have tea, which was wonderful. Um, so Kimmy Kyung, we are hoping to bring here at some point in the next calendar year. Um, we had hoped to involve her in a residency project that we had going, but she fell and broke her leg and is um, not as spry as she once was, and it was felt that we should just wait until she'd fully recovered and bring her here on her own. So instead, we have focused on a series of other ceramics, many of these made by Korean ceramicists um, in the United States, as well as some in Korea. So Cho Chun Hyung, former um, president of Ihua Women's University in Seoul, um, her daughter Hong Soon Jun, um, Kim Myung Jin, whose work you see here, and there's another one in the other gallery, uh, Lee Hoon, and the fabulous uh, Lee Yong Ho that I had mentioned previously. And this is a loan from a local collector, Kyung Gregor, of a piece that was done in the 1970s. So this is, we had started out with traditional ceramics here, and as different artists came, we replaced them one by one with contemporary pieces that were speaking to different aspects of Korean tradition. So um, I think in particular, uh, Li Hoon's fabulous piece, which is so kind of science fiction and strange, and yet is using a very traditional bunchong type um, textured surface on the surface of this very strange little creature that's masks are held on with rubber bands and has that kind of cone of shame made a, almost like a satellite dish. But um, I think we'll pop into the large gallery for just a moment before heading into China. He, if you look at the title of it, <laughs> it gives you a sense. Lee yeah. Hoon is so wonderful. I, I'm sorry, I should use the proper Lee, Dr. Lee. Um, I know him personally, so I am calling him Hoon, but that's like me calling Leonardo da Vinci Leo. So, <laughs> so Dr. Lee um, is a very playful soul. So um, because you can't see it, I will read you, and I have to read you, the title of this work of art. So this is called... In contemporary art does, quote, regression of subject, end quote, discoursed especially after postmodernism, have any correlation with, quote, the craftsman, end quote, parentheses, Senate, 2008, end parentheses, as subject, question mark. So he plays with theory, and he likes to mess with people. But he is a consummate craftsperson and very proud of the skill that he has addressed. And yet he's mixing in kind of playful vernacular imagery. You'll see there's um, on the porcelain pieces that are cast, um, he has all sorts of transfer images from pop culture and different blueprints and diagrams. It's a very strange kind of atypical it. object. So cool. It is. Yes. Are we allowed to take pictures? Certainly. Okay. Absolutely. So we have a few other contemporary pieces um, in the large gallery. So um, the show was intended to celebrate two things, both that residency project and the um, publication of a couple of bilingual catalogs of the JSMA's Korean collection. And um, here we have another fabulous Kim Mi Kyung piece. So while we were looking at the stools, Jill sort of sidled over to one side and said, what is this? What is this? And Kimmy Kyung said, oh, I was playing. And Jill said, oh, I love it. So since we were sending those, we thought we would send this as well. So um, this is called The Oak. And actually, at the time she was making this, she started reading poems by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And she decided to associate this with Tennyson's poem, The Oak. Um, some of the other pieces are made by some of the other artists who came here during the residency project. But the artists that I thought I would focus on in here are actually Pek Namjoon, who is um, generally considered to be the father of video art, um, and who is a deeply eccentric soul. He was born in 1932 in Korea, um, a Korean man from a wealthy family in Seoul. And um, he actually got his college education in Japan, where he studied avant-garde German music, particularly Schoenberg. And after graduating, he moved to Germany, and he joined Fluxus, the kind of crazy group of artists surrounding George Machiunas, but including John Cage, um, Merce Cunningham, uh, Joseph Boyce. You can actually see a number of them, both on the face of that little robot at the far end of the gallery and in the suite of four prints, each of which kind of function as a retrospective of Paik's life. 
Um, in them, you will see images of works that he had done, people he's collaborated with, um, Taoist trigrams from the I Ching, musical scores, pictures, pictograms, um, texts in various languages. And quite tellingly, every single shape that you see, all of those little boxes are not boxes, but they're the shapes of television screens. So Paik lived a life that was kind of mediated through a screen. And even the base of that adorable little robot at the far end is not a rectangle, but it is the shape of a screen. So that is kind of like his base shape, not a geometric shape, but something that relates to media. Um, we are very fortunate that we have a couple of pieces now that relate to Peik Namjoon, and I see them as the gateway drug. There are lots of students who are frightened of Asian art, they, they're really more interested in sort of contemporary art, and many of them don't even understand that Paik is Korean. But the promise of a Paik Namjoon piece, or I should say a Namjoon Paik piece, um, will bring them into this gallery, at which point I hope they will fall in love with Kim Hee Kyung, with Hana Kim, with other artists, and will lead them on a different journey. Um, the Paik pieces that we have, that uh, portfolio, and especially the robot, the robot is called Lilliputian. And it is one of a number of similarly sized robots that Paik was making when he was in the process of preparing a large installation piece called Gulliver. And in 2010, this museum was lucky enough to have a traveling exhibition um, here that featured Gulliver. And Gulliver was made of antique televisions in the shape of the giant on the ground. And the giant was being held down by wires and these little Lilliputian robots, each of which had things going on their screens. Um, this seems to be an extra Lilliputian. And our director saw this at an art fair and texted me saying, we should get this. And I thought, we can't afford that. But we were lucky enough that one of our benefactors used to be Paik's physician. And he feels remorse because instead of cash, he helped many artists in New York, um, many of them paid in um, with art. And Paik offered him the iconic, now, um, image of the Buddha watching television, this strange installation. And at the time, it was perfectly understandable. The doctor said, no, you can owe me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, in retrospect, he realizes that, oh my god, I could have had the textbook Paik work. And so when we contacted him and mentioned that we were trying, we were aspiring to get such a piece, he very graciously said, I will help you so that the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art will not go on feeling the regret that I continue to feel until this day. <laughs> so that is why we're lucky enough to have that. So the last piece I thought we'd look at before we head into China is on the far wall, this fabulous barnacle-like, um, very subtly colored piece. So this is another work that bespeaks international context. Um, this is by an artist called Chun Kwan Yong, who is Korean um, and had studied at Hongik University in Seoul and then came to the United States and was studying Western style painting in Philadelphia. At that time, the prevailing style was abstract expressionism. And so like all good students, he was very inspired by what he saw around him, and he produced abstract expressionist-like paintings. And he went back to Korea, and he actually had a great deal of success with such works. However, he felt insincere, because he felt that abstract expressionism were really the expressions of American artists, and that as a Korean, this was not his natural medium. And he struggled for a while trying to figure out how to do something that would express what he wanted to express as himself, as an individual, and as a Korean national. And once in the 1990s, when he wasn't feeling well, he recalled in his youth that his mother used to give him packets of traditional Korean medicine wrapped in paper. And he set upon using paper wrapping shapes to create art that is absolutely uniquely his own. And he began to dye these papers with different natural pigments. And this is his new metier. This is what he does. And uh, we were so fortunate we were able to go and meet with him and acquire this in May. And at this time next year, I think we will be featuring a number of such works in this room that are currently on view at the Brooklyn Museum, where a friend of mine is curator. So 
um, it's very exciting for us to have something like this where you have an artist who's kind of trying to find a voice. And I think it's, it's noble in a way that despite the fact that he, I think, was having a nice living doing abstract expressionist paintings, it was not internally satisfying. And therefore, he felt that he needed to move on and do something that was more um, honest, that was a reflection of his true self. He collects old papers from all over. He cannibalizes books and he uses them randomly. He doesn't use them with the thought that, you know, you put this page next to this page next to this page. But I think it's just like many voices calling out from the past. So it's not a, a particular song, it's just kind of cacophony. But it's, I mean, it's kind of an amazing sentiment. And I must say, these are more typical of what he does. He started to do some that are like bright blue, which look like something else entirely. And they're, they're fabulous. But it's a little bit harder to relate, unless you know this intermediate step, because it's very different. <laughs> but um, because we have so much ground to cover, we're going to walk on to China. I know, it's a pretty short walk from, from Korea to China in terms of our galleries, but. <laughs> so I'm going to pause for one moment here, not spend too much time, but um, this exhibition is a rotation about Taoism in Chinese art. And uh, we are fortunate that we have fabulous Chinese art and especially fabulous Taoist textiles, including these three Taoist priest vestments. But recently we were able to acquire this, which is related to, but still very different than these. So um, these vestments are Qing dynasty robes that were used by a Taoist priest in order to do um, uh, ceremonies. That is actually not um, Han Chinese, but is in fact made by the Yao people. So the Yao are a group of people, one of the different ethnicities of China, but in fact they spread far beyond China's borders into Laos, into Vietnam. And what's amazing to me about this work is when I first saw it, I thought, wait, it reminds me, it has some Taoist-like imagery. For example, all of the Taoist robes in the center of the back have this tall tower, which is where the immortals are supposed to dwell, and a surrounding of, um, in these cases, constellations. But it doesn't have a lot of the other things that it's supposed to have. And more to the point, it has, quote unquote, Chinese characters around the side that were clearly done by somebody who doesn't read Chinese. So it's kind of a one recension of another recension of another recension. But these symbols have become sacred, and it wasn't necessary for the person who made this to be able to read the text for the, the sort of sacredness of, you know, the efficacy of this robe to work for the priest who used it. So it's kind of an interesting addition to a gallery that is otherwise largely Qing Dynasty mainstream work, um, but we were very pleased we were able to put this out. So with that, we'll head to the other end of the gallery. Okay. So at this end of the gallery, we have two large works. So practically everything else in the room is Qing. We do have one contemporary photograph just to the left of that door and um, one Taiwanese painting that is quite lovely in here. But for the most part, what we have is Qing Dynasty art. Um, however, when I first got here, I had the sense that um, Gertrude Best Warner, our founder's collection, was so strong in traditional Chinese art. But there was a little bit of a sense that China just kind of ended at 1900. And it was nice to be able to kind of speak towards the modern and contemporary periods. And more recently, we've been able to do so in involving a lot of faculty and students in the process. So this is one of 440 um, Chinese propaganda posters from the mid 20th century that I surveyed with a number of students and that morphed into one gallery rotation in this space and a special exhibition in our Barker Gallery space last fall at this time. Um, this one is really interesting in that it predates the Cultural Revolution. Cultural Revolution is um, 1966 through 76. I believe this is from 63. Um, and this actually shows the different ethnicities of China 
And the reason it's in this Taoist exhibition is because despite the fact that the communist revolution sought to suppress traditional religious beliefs, Taoism is still present in the form of the peaches of immortality that you see being carried. So peaches are a theme that you'll see throughout this gallery because they're associated with the queen mother of the West, the sort of main Taoist deity, who, for example, in the large textile in the center of the gallery is seen flying down into a landscape, being welcomed by other immortals who are there to celebrate her birthday. Um, the Queen Mother of the West birthday happens once every 3,000 years at the time when the peaches in her orchard come to fruition. And anyone who eats of those peaches will be, gain immortality. So peaches are a, a kind of quick signal for immortality. And Taoism is all about prosperity, longevity, and um, fecundity. So here we have all the different peoples of China holding up the peaches of immortality beneath the sun. And of course, the sun in any of these posters doesn't just represent the sun in the sky, but it represents Mao Zedong, the sun of all of us. Um, so here you have something that takes from kind of a Soviet uh, social realist style, but does so in a kind of fairy tale way. It's a really interesting composite because it certainly has a part of that idealized realism that you see in the social uh, Soviet realism posters. And yet you've got clouds from Tibetan Tonka paintings, and you've got the peaches of immortality from Taoism, and all of these different figures that look like children's book figures. It's, it's an interesting combination. So I'm talking about this in part because this work of art by the contemporary artist um, Hong Liu in Western word order, or Liu Hong in traditional Chinese word order, um, actually started as a cultural revolution propaganda artist. So Liu Hong, um, was sent to the countryside as a young girl and to be re-educated and by living with the peasants. And during that time, she had a camera with her and she was able to document a lot of what she saw around her. And she did some really beautiful paintings that were called her secret freedom paintings. She paid a princely sum for a tiny art kit and she took the very little time that she had to herself when she wasn't having to work on the farm or process food um, in order to paint things that she saw around her with absolutely no political ulterior motive. Um, this, these were hard times. People saw some of the paintings that she did and just because within the landscape that she portrayed there was an outhouse, she was chastised and brought, brought in front of others saying you must be critical of the government to be showing an outhouse in your painting. Um, it's, it's hard for us to imagine the suppression that was prevalent at the time. But um, she went to the countryside, she spent time with peasants, she took those photographs, she did paintings. Afterwards, she went on to become a propaganda artist and she actually hosted a television program about how to paint. Um, and she was amongst the first cohort of students who were allowed to go out and be educated outside of China. So she applied to come to the United States and in fact, she applied seven consecutive times because although she was accepted to art school in California, the Chinese government wouldn't give her her visa. So after seven years, they finally relented and she went to Southern California. And it is hard to imagine the culture shock that she must have experienced because she landed and worked with Alan Capro, who is the father of The Happening. So she has gone from a restrictive, politically inclined, repressive, propagandistic style to freewheeling, you know, something just the absolute opposite of everything that she's ever experienced. And deciding to live here and work here, marrying an American, and realizing that she really couldn't go back for a number of reasons, um, she needed to figure out how to change her style because she is a formidable social realist artist. She can draw anything and she can do it quickly and she can make it look amazing. But she needed to inject a sort of more universal sense of realism and also a sense of expression into what she was doing. And she did this by kind of loosening her brush strokes and, um, and using past imagery such as the photographs that she had taken in the countryside, and this is in fact based on the photograph of a little girl that she charmingly calls the little swan, who she has blown up to enormous goddess-like scale, superimposed against a scene that shows um, a, a Confucian ancestor portrait with not a man, but a woman in the background, 
different generations and then just rows and rows and rows of different ancestors in the background. Um, with the little girl and then those peaches of immortality, bats, which are a homonym for happiness, and all these incredible gestural strokes. Um, this looks like a painting, and in fact, it does have painted elements, but it is, in fact, a multiple. It's a mixed media print, and it's a, um, a technique that Hung had collaborated on with a master printer at a company called Trillium in California, um, David Salgado. And together, Hung and David Salgado have decided to donate 55 of these works, ranging in size from this big to five and a half feet tall and 20 feet wide to the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. So in the future, we will be featuring a major exhibition of this body of work, um, so many of which are so rich in what they show and so noble and humane in the way they uplift the subject matter of people who have no power, no voice, no autonomy, and make them larger than, than themselves and give a promise of hope even to Imagery is hard to witness as people who are starving, people who have suffered through terrible natural disasters, and all the different crises of war, um, comfort women, and the like. So, um, but Hung is an amazing cross-cultural artist, and there are so many different vectors that go out in different ways through her art. So with that, I think we should follow Cheryl into our last space. This is ours. She was, and she's actually going to be speaking um, Thursday night next week, so a week from tomorrow, in Salem at the Halley Fort. So she's phenomenal. Yes. Uh, she just turned 72, I think. Yeah. But she's a force of nature. Are there still tickets available for the Salem thing? I don't even think it's ticketed. I mean, I think it's probably oh, just... I love the presentation of this. This Isn't is so fabulous? nice. Whoever thought of this is, is the presentation. It's very clever. The connections can be made between the artists that we have on view, who knew each other and who worked with each other. So we have this gorgeous um, sculpture by Modigliani. And he actually um, painted at least two portraits of Diego Rivera as well as a number of um, sketches, works on paper, um, because they were together in Paris. That's where Rivera was um, during the Mexican Revolution. Don't believe what he writes in his um, autobiography because he said he was fighting on the front lines, you know. He makes up this big story about, you know, to bring him closer to the ideals of the government. But anyway, he was really in, um, you know, Montparnasse, I don't know how to pronounce it, but you know, probably having a glass of wine with people like Modigliani and, um, you know, sketching one another. But anyway, um, so that's, yeah, that's what he was doing, working on Cubist paintings before he went back to Mexico and then started the murals, which was a huge phenomenon um, that then came to the U.S. Um, and eventually the WPA project, which he influenced too in this country. We're going to go into the, our Focus West and take a look at uh, Reframing the Fragments, a show of um, Vietnamese, Vietnamese American, Vietnamese diaspora, and, and some artists who were um, active in the 60s during the um, protesting the Vietnam War. <coughs> contact you later to uh, somebody get article for this. Sure. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Let me give you... Um, Have any of you read this book? This is the common uh, reading here um, this year at University of Oregon. Um, for the last several years, um, at least three, if not four or more, um, the university has selected a book and every uh, first year student receives it during their introduction. And um, the university likes to uh, 
you know, have conversations around this book, both at the graduate level, undergraduate level, and um, when possible, they invite um, the author to come and give a talk. So T, um, Bui is actually coming to the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art for a reception, and uh, you're all invited. It's going to be January 30th, so she'll be here. She won't um, speak that evening. It's kind of a meet and greet um, after she flies up for, you know, from... Uh, she lives down in uh, the Bay Area, but who knows where she's coming from. But anyway, um, you're welcome to that. And then she'll also be giving some readings. Um, so this year, it's a graphic memoir. So it's a story um, about her, her life and her parents' life. Um, and she taught herself how to do these amazing um, drawings, ink drawings, um, and it's really, you know, quite amazing. You can go um, online and sort of see her whole process of um, all the years, you know, that she worked um, and kind of the different iterations of the book, but it started out with, um, she's a uh, wanting to find out more about who her parents were before they became parents. Mm -hmm. And um, she interviews them, and then it was translating, you know, the Vietnamese into and capturing the same nuances of the stories that they're telling. First of all, it's kind of getting them to talk. <laughs> and then, um, you know, piecing together all of these fragments of, of memories that they have. But it's a story um, of uh, trauma and loss and um, some joyful moments, but a lot of um, pain and suffering um, in Vietnam. These are the last six um, pages of chapter two, and um, it's she goes through and uh, talks about the birth of all of her um, siblings. And this is 1965. And um, uh, someone at the hospital is saying, I'm sorry, we did the best that we could do. And that's, you know, it's, it's really interesting because that phrase, the best that we could do, um, has so many different meanings about her, T. Bui, the, the author as a mother, doing the best she could do, her parents doing the best they could do, other people trying to do the best they could do in these, um, in these very um, stressful circumstances. Um, so, uh, her family loses um, a number of children, actually, um, and she feels that that um, weight and that shadow stretches for a long way. And even though they eventually, after the fall of Saigon, they make it um, in a boat to Malaysia and um, eventually come to the, make it to the United States, um, of course, the troubles don't end, right? That we've had some community conversations about immigrants and um, that oftentimes they say the hardest part is just trying to um, have a life in their new place, in their new country. Um, that's harder than even leaving sometimes or what they experience during a war um, is all, all of those adjustments and things that you know continue to haunt you. So that's what she's talking about. What struck me today is um, she said, have they ever, she's talking about her parents who are actually separated, but they do things together. Um, have they ever looked at us, their kids, and felt slightly such high hopes, you know, are they disappointed? So much possibility to fall short. 
And I know when we had the suitcase in another exhibition, Dialogos, and people were to put their hopes and fears in there, um, we got over 2,000 hopes and fears. And a lot of the fears that I read were people saying, can I live up to my parents' expectation? Can I make my family proud? Um, and that, that really stayed with me. Um, and also seeing it here of her own tease questioning there. Of, um, so it's, a, it's an amazing story. You learn a lot about um, the history and, and also um, her kind of mixed feelings about the stories that she hears about the war from a US perspective and what she learns from her parents, from their perspective, and how these things are kind of pieced together, and what, you know, what are the um, predominant voices, prevailing voices? Is it images in the media, um, in Hollywood, um, or is it something, you know, very personal? And one of the ways that this grief is expressed here is not so much um, maybe with an expression there or words, but um, the walking. So you see this repeated throughout um, the graphic memoir of um, this idea of, of walking to kind of work out the, you know, some of the demons or, um, you know, shadows in, in your life. Um, and she worries that she's going to pass this on to her own son that she's about to give birth to, that these things will just kind of continue and stay in the family. Um, so many of these artists here, they're looking at kind of these intergenerational um, relationships. What came before? What is your future? And how do you bridge these things to kind of give you a a grounded <laughs> foundation. Um, oh yeah, we've, well, we've gone over a little bit, but do any of you have a particular work of art that's catching your eye and we could talk about that in here? Oh, okay. Well, a lot of students pick these works out too. And I have to say, with the show, we kind of debated, you know, how many um, artists um, who are non-Vietnamese will we have in the exhibit? Or, um, but we decided to include a few artists um, who were active in the 60s and still active um, in terms of uh, their imagery um, documenting, in this case, protests against the war, or actually creating these, um, what were actually uh, collages that then became pamphlets that were handed to people on the other side of the barricade. So to try to activate them to um, start thinking about um, their own um, politics and feelings about um, the Vietnam War. So this is the work of Violet Ray, um, who lives here in Eugene. Actually, he has a video that we just started showing in our lounge. And it's about registering to vote, I think. That's, so he's still very, um, well, politically active, of course. And he um, started going through Life magazine, and there would be, you know, images, these horrific images um, from photojournalists, and then the ads. And um, he started seamlessly fitting these things together, you know, back in the days where you cut <laughs> and you paste. And they look so Fresh. I mean, these are from 1966, okay? So I, <laughs> that's when I was born. And I look at these today, and they, I find them so disturbing. Like, over the years, 
they haven't um, lessened their impact of, you know, of, um, you know, just this horror because he's working with all of the psychology of advertising here. So this is you sitting there and opening this present and, and that's what you're being given, you know, for, for the holidays. Um, so we decided to show Violet Ray's work here um, kind of in between these two, again, because these were photocopied and handed out because he was sort of disappointed with, um, you know, slogans, signs, things that he felt were made at such a remove, didn't really like, you know, kind of like surrealism where it's really jolting you out of your normal everyday routine um, to just make a radical change. That's what he wanted to do. Like, what, it, you know, yeah, exactly. So much more effective than a leaflet that has a whole bunch of writing that you're not going to read. Something like this just hits you right between the eyes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, also next to um, Dan Q. Lee's work, um, I thought, here is someone else who's working with images um, that um, are from movies, um, but weaving them together with the um, emulation of the, of the monk. Again, another horrific um, image that was uh, mm -hmm. circulated widely and turned a number of these really turned the, the political tide um, against the war. But then, almost like Hung Lu, um, he's incorporating other images. It took me a while to really see these faces. But he goes to kind of um, antique stores, flea markets, and he buys um, photographs or photo albums, things that families in, you know, left couldn't take with them. And so a lot of his imagery is of, you know, anonymous people, people he doesn't know, but he keeps using them over and over again um, in his work and almost even, you know, kind of um, they stand in for certain um, personal memories that he has. But he learned this weaving technique from his aunt making grass mats and he wanted to sort of show this complex relationship between what he was sort of fed about the war um, after coming to the United States and sort of that pressure, you know, by his peers. Have you seen this movie? Did you, you know, and, um, and also his, I mean, his own personal um, memories and other kind of, you know, anonymous uh, images and weaving that together. And he says it's, it's neither fact nor fiction. So um, it's this constant, yeah, negotiation of, of how he's experiencing um, the past. And he, after a while, he felt um, that Vietnam really was his home. He felt more Vietnamese than Vietnamese American. And so after going to art school and having um, you know, shows both in galleries and museums in the States, which he continues to have, um, he said, I'm moving back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really incredible that an artist you know, goes to another place. And again, things are given up, his artistic freedom in one sense that someone is looking at what he's making and uh, approving it or just, you know, just proving it. Um, but he's gaining a lot of things too that are feeding um, his art. So he's in Ho Chi Minh City, yeah, working. Mm -hmm. But these are, this is an earlier work and you can see how he changes his weaving techniques depending on, um, yeah the period in, in his um, production, as well as the imagery. Or... So because I had nothing to do with the organization of the show, I'd like to brag for a moment on behalf of Sharon. <laughs> 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 I'm 
are the hardest shows that this museum does. Because usually you plan two years, or at least a year in advance. But with the common reading, we don't often get much notice. <laughs> and this particular show, how much notice did you get? Oh, uh, yeah, well, we had less than six months, probably, to put it together. And we so. don't have a lot of Korean art, in our, or, I'm sorry, Vietnamese art in our collection. So yeah. if we are lucky enough to have a topic that coincides with something in which we have strength, we're golden. But for something like this that requires a great deal of legwork in order to go out and find artwork that would be appropriate and is lendable in such a short time frame is not simple. Yeah. And yet this hangs together so beautifully. Yeah, and then to put it together in such a way that it really tells a story, it's an amazing. Oh. amazing. Well, for the yeah. students who've read that book, there are so many of tendrils here that they can pick up and reweave together in different ways. And some people are verbal people and you know can deal with the written word, and some are visual. And this allows them to have mm -hmm. conversations that bridge both, like a graphic novel. So it's kind of perfect. Mm -hmm. And for the students who've lived through this, right. there's some yeah. capacity. Yeah. Yeah. There's a sense of ownership that is, you know, it's, it, that's the nice thing as the University of Oregon goes through these different readings the different voices that we're hearing from students who then start to feel like the museum is their safe space in which they can voice their opinions. Yeah. But not easy. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, it was challenging, but fun. Yes. Myself and Danielle Knapp, who's sorry, her flight was delayed, so she couldn't join us tonight, but um, she was gonna talk about this show, but. Um, that's why you have two curators work on something so we can all cover for each other. And so can you all come back whenever we give talk? This is the best because sometimes you have huge talks. Nobody can see anything. It's completely yeah. not intimate. No one can ask questions. This is perfect. This is perfect. <laughs> this is perfect. It really is. Thank you so yeah. much. You're Thank you welcome. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful things. Art is cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>